Yeah, I, I just recently found out that uh, Bob and Penny are fourth generation here. His great grandparents settled here, Edith and George Shambaugh. And so Bob's been coming up since he was a little boy, and you'll have to look for a picture and see if you can recognize him when he's up this, this, this tall. But it's, a, it's an interesting presentation. I think you're going to be glad you came. Okay, there are two more seats and a third one. Okay. Maybe a fourth. And Penny Rosie. This is Bob. Oh. <laughs> and Ann Sweeney. For those of you who don't, Ann is, is she's our assistant today. And uh, before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about our resources. We didn't, we're not making any of this up. Or we, we've heard through the history of, in Bob's family certain things, but there's not every. They can't tell you everything. They don't remember everything. But the first one is a book called Delightful Dog, and it was written published in 1903. Four. 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 The author is Elliot Flower. And the reason that this book is so important in terms of our um, presentation is that this, the property that's described in this book is the property that we live on, which is um, has uh, some old buildings, um, an old barn. Um, what else do we have? Wagon there? shed. Chicken house. Uh, oil shed. House. House. Well, well, we have a house, but not the original house. We have a photograph of the original house on the property. Um, anyway, it's uh, kind of secluded, and you wouldn't even know it's there until you came down a little bit on an old dirt road. But um, so I'm going to read a little bit of something about the description of the properties that are associated with the story. The second is that old standard Elizabeth Potter's book about the history of old Michigan, or the story of old Michigan. She references something, not quite as well as others. Um, this is a real joy. This was the memoir, Memories, written by Addison Wilkin. A lot of you know Addison, who's a very important person in the community, in the Methodist Church in particular. Um, and a really dear friend, and he lived on the property that we live on for how beginning many? in 1918. 1918 until 19... until they moved away. Until they moved away. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he, every once in a while he'd give us a call and say, "Can I come out to the old place?" And he'd drive. Out. He drove for a long time. He was in his 90s, and he was still driving. <laughs> And he'd come out and he said, well, this isn't how I remembered it exactly, because we moved a couple of buildings around. Um, the old house was taken down. We built, built another house that fits in. But in any event, uh, his memories really are, I'll be reading from them. And then there's Bonnie West's book. Bonnie West is the mom of Penny Polly. Many of you know her. And Bonnie West uh, published a book called The Strip. Just, um, uh, it's not so commercially, but everyone who lives on the Strip has a copy of it. And one of the beautiful things that we have, this is published in 1974. 56. <laughs> um, well, the dedication was in 1974. <laughs> Keeps you young. Um, and she just, and anyway, I'll read some things about that, but she included all of her wonderful little drawings in this book. And you won't be able to see them, but she was truly, she was a commercial artist, um, and she carried her artwork throughout her whole life. So it's really elegantly um, described and, and um, drawn. And um, for instance, in the, you can see from any distance, um, you'll see the story, and then you'll see some of the, buildings that were part of the, the whole strip. This one being the house that had been torn down, which is the one that's on our property. And um, uh, I'm not sure what those other are, but she, she really captured the sense of the place historically. So those are the, our resources. And, um, and then, of course, just common knowledge in our community. And this community is a Bob and me, but I just came on the scene in 1965, so. Um, but Bob's brother Philip is here, Bob's brother Tom is here, back there. And, and 
Anyway, we think that maybe next summer we'll, we'll give the whole program to this, the people who live on the strip in the summertime, because most of them are summer. summer. Oh, Becky, I'm sorry. He's strong. Oh, and Jeff. Oh, my. That's the, no, that's the north end of the strip. We're at the south end of the strip. Okay. Um, and then Bob did, we also, surprisingly enough, one of the key players in this whole thing, um, uh, when we were out in Glacier National Park, uh, we we were able, we didn't get as much information as we maybe should have because we were there, but uh, uh, it was... Regarding L.O. Vought, who you'll hear more about as we proceed. So Vought went out, and if you were to go to Glacial National Park, you will see, are you going to talk about that? The Mount Vought? Um, I'll just mention it real quickly. Uh, if you go to Lake McDonald at Glacier National Park, you'll see all these peaks around, you know, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sight. And there's one that's called Mount Vought. And when Mr. Vought went out there, he climbed that Mount Peak. And that gave him uh, naming rights. And um, I think that's pretty much Mount, Mount Helen, after his wife and uh, but it turned out that there were already was a Mount Helen in the range, <laughs> so he had to rely upon his last name. <laughs> so um, this is just a, a a nice old photograph that we came upon, and that is the route that goes out to the lighthouse. It has nothing to do with our particular property, but if you were to follow M37, I presume this is a precursor precursor to M37, but maybe not, I don't know, but anyway, it's an old uh, photograph that we came upon since we've lived up in In addition to the references, there was a, some National Park Service references that I came upon, as well as uh, some uh, computer references to Vought that uh, you could pull up also. Okay, ready, Ben? Page two. Page two. This is a, uh, a photograph of the garden as around uh, 1948, uh, shortly after uh, World War II. This is one of my earliest memories of uh, summers in Old Mission. And uh, in the photo are my two older brothers who are here, as well, well as, uh, as our papa. Uh, who had just returned from uh, service in the war. My family was spending a number of weeks at, in the Vaught House, which was nearby the garden on the shore of Grand Traverse Bay. And that's the next picture, Carl. <laughs> this is the Vaught House uh, where we were staying, built by Vaught uh, personally, around 1913, uh, we uh, the, we all slept on the second floor. My brothers and I, mostly on the sleeping porch, except during uh, inclement weather. And the house had all the necessary conveniences: it had uh, running water, a flush toilet, uh, an ice box <laughs> with a a, a um, ice house. Uh, about a hundred or so feet away, uh, self-serve, a uh, <laughs> wood-burning fireplace for heat, a kerosene stove alongside the ice hot, I, alongside the ice box in the kitchen, and kerosene lamps and candles for light. <laughs> made by my eldest brother uh, around 1950. It's a sketch of the strip, which is another thing used for the Ionic cottagers. And it details the mile-long strip. In this, uh, you could, a close examination, you can see 13 separate family lots, 24 living st structures, some without kitchens, five sleeping cabins, a tent frame, and a bathhouse. 
section, the chapter is chapter 7, and it's called A Terrace Cottage, which is that old, no, it is, this is slightly different. You'll, you'll find out about Terrace Cottage in just a short time. The Panic, this is by um, Elliot Flower, 1903, 4. The peninsula that runs out into Grand Traverse Bay rises in great terraces from the water, and these terraces continue below the surface of the water. In some places, there is a sheer drop only a few feet from the shore, and in others, one may walk or wade a considerable distance out before reaching the edge of a submerged terrace. But it is there, and presumably, there are others beyond. In brief, the peninsula is a huge flight of steps rising out of the Grand Traverse Bay. A sort of elongated pyramid with a very uneven top. And where the Jog Farm stood, there were three terraces, designated upper, middle, and lower, before the bay was reached. A steep and tortuous road led down to the water with roads branching out to right at right angles on each terrace. Reaching the middle terrace in leisurely fashion, the three, and these are the characters in the book. Um, uh, let's see, blah, 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 blah. the three uh, rested a few minutes and they sauntered northward along the winding road on this terrace. This is our road. The, log, uh, the big straight trees came right to the edge of the road, the torturous nature of which made it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. Thus they came upon the cottage suddenly, so deeply hidden it was it. Yet they, when they reached it, it seemed extraordinary that it could be so concealed. It was not a small cottage by any means, having two stories and an attic and a total of nine rooms, while behind it stood a barn and wagon shed. Um, nevertheless, these buildings were so placed that there was no hint of their presence until one came almost upon them. Although being on the edge of the middle terrace, they were, there was a good water view over the tops of the trees to the terrace below. <coughs> Um, is that the next picture up or not? No, it's going to Okay. But it was called Terrace Cottage because of the terrace that they were on. Mm -hmm. To understand the strip or the Atlanta cottages, we must go back to the beginning. The deeds to all of these properties go back to 1861, recorded in 1862, and begin. United States conveys pursuant to the Act of Congress approved March 3rd, 1855, entitled An Act in Addition to Certain Acts Granting Bounty Lands to Certain Officers and Soldiers Who Have, who have Engaged in Military Service of the United States. And this was signed by uh, Abraham Lincoln along with some other uh, parties. Sometime before 1881, Henry Reynolds, a wealthy man from Lansing, bought a large tract of land along the bay, just north of Mr. Tyrer, from Alicia, Alicia Franklin, part of which he put into an experimental fruit farm. Mm -hmm. Sam Walker, a banker in St. John's, Michigan, who had some unfortunate business experience, purchased the entire property from Reynolds, uh, before 1895. Due to his business reverses, Mr. Walker was unable to develop his land as he had planned when he bought it, but had to make a paying proposition out of his farm. He took boarders during the summer months, and one of these, who was the author, who was an author, put Mr. Walker and his farm into a book entitled Delightful God. That's the one I read from the first time. So we get that connection. According to this novel, Mr. Walker was an intelligent, educated man with a sense of humor and a fondness for teasing, who had all manner of exciting things happen on his farm, including the cat. Oh, no, we're not going to go into that. that that's, because, that's when you go from history into historical fiction, so we're not going to go into that. Okay. We good? <laughs> 
It was also around 1870 that Mr. Walker built the farmhouse previously referred to in London's treasure cottage. What Mr. Walker's plans for the property were is unclear. The farmhouse, treasure cottage, and the middle terrace could have supported additional structures on the lower terrace, which actually occurred under the Alumni cottagers. Insights into what these plans were can be seen in the reading of the delightful dot. But now we transition to Jacksonville, Illinois, 37 miles west of Springfield, Illinois. Uh, while this was going on in Old Michigan, Michigan, in Jacksonville, we were the forerunners of the strip. Forerunners of the strip. In Jacksonville, Illinois, at the turn of the 20th century, a congenial group of professors, doctors, and lawyers met each Sunday evening for a picnic outdoors. Hilarious fun caused them to call each other idiots and lunatics. <laughs> Finally, they chose a name which stuck ever after, the Looney Ox. In winter, they met in Mr. Vaught's backyard where Vaughty, a lanky lawyer, was chief cook presiding over a gray, huge gray enamel coffee pot. His wife, Helen, was glad to escape meal preparation. Uh, Professor Ames, known as Griff, is Judy here? Mm -hmm. She couldn't come. Mm -hmm. Professor Ames, known as Griff, with his a mischievous wife, Eleanor, never missed a picnic. Dr. Ramelkamp, the college president, and his stately wife, Jeanette, brought along the youngest Luniats, Luniats, Ralph and Louise Dunlap. <laughs> Miss Mariah Fairbank was the lone Luniat, and her relatives, Arthur and Miss Georgia, also joined the group. Jacksonville's beloved lady doctors, Grace Dewey and Josephine Milligan, were devoted friends of all the families. In the springtime, the Luniats drove out to Dr. Dewey's woods in their fringe top surreys. Unpacking pillows from the old wooden piano box, they made themselves comfortable on a log before Vaudy's fire. While the fragrant coffee brewed, they sang songs and told stories. From these informal weekends, the Luniats built up a rare friendship which endured. Being enduring was it, be, so enduring was it that when Vaudy bought the Deer Acres, which became the strip, he naturally turned to his Luniats to share his find. And that was written by Judy Rule's mom, uh, Eleanor May Ames Rule. Back about 1890, a friend of Vaught, who was a mail clerk for the Great Northern Railroad, uh, was able to arrange for the train uh, to stop for Vaught and his friends, the Lumiats, to get off and camp in remote sites. One such trip in 1894 took them to a temporary stop during railroad construction at East Glacier. And according to the National Park Service, Belton, Montana was one of the temporary stops during the railroad construction and was known as West Glacier. In 1898, according to early visitor L. O. Vaught, Visitors could get off the train at Belton and go to the new store saloon built by Ed Dow. Since the train stopped at 4.30 in the morning, however, the store was not open and the Vought party of 14 had to build a fire along the tracks to keep from freezing. After crossing the Middle, middle Fork and walking to the foot of Lake McDonald, the Vought party from Illinois then established a camp for their hometown Jacksonville on the present site, named for their hometown, hometown Jacksonville, on the present site of Sprague Creek Campground. Perhaps only the most idealistic visitors like L. O. Vaught refused the opportunity to own part of this country. The Great Northern Railroad had begun construction and entered into the mountains in 1891. One summer around 1900, the children of the Luniats told their parents they no longer wanted to spend their summer vacations camping in the wilderness areas with their parents and their friends, the Luniats. And Hello Vought 
then decided to visit his sister-in-law, a Mrs. Cleary of Jacksonville, Illinois. She a teacher of the deaf and her husband a deaf mute. They had a small farm about halfway between the Strip and Bowers Harbor on the old Mission Peninsula. Vaught traveled with Griff Ames, an English professor at Illinois College and fellow Luniat. After visiting with the Clearys, or perhaps staying with them, they looked at property in the vicinity. Seeing the land between Old Mission Road and Sweeney Road, inquiry was made at Lardy's store in Old Mission, Michigan. They learned the owner and took out an option from Mr. Walker for one mile of sandy beach with accompanying strip of woods. It was love at first sight, and he bought it. The whole mile of it. The actual deed, along the, with the deeds of his uh, subsequent sales to friends, may be seen at the courthouse in Traverse City in the Register of Deeds, index, C index 1908-1911, under Vought as grantee. He lists two. 210.62 uh, acres running south from Sweeney Road, section 33, township 30, range 10 bucks, sold to L.O. Vaught in 1910. This included all property between Sweeney Road on the north and Old Mission on the south, bounded by Grand Traverse Bay on the west and the Peninsula Drive on the east, excluding the southeast corner. Convinced that he had purchased one of nature's loveliest spots, Mr. Vaught returned to his home in Jacksonville, Illinois. His enthusiasm was contagious and several, several friends who shared his love of the outdoors bought parcels of land from him as early as November 1st of that same year. And Mr. Vaught, in 1947, reflecting on what had transpired, wrote a letter to a uh, friend saying it was dated uh, August 12, 1947, Lake McDonald, Montana. <clears throat> I wish I were younger by, say, 20 years and where I was 20 years ago. If that were true, I would try to interest you in a project or plan for the ranch along with the lines of our Michigan place. Some 35 years ago, wife and I decided to form a Michigan summer colony. Her sister had a little farm on the old Bishop Peninsula sticking into Grand Traverse Bay to which she and her family went for the summer. So we cast up there and found a place near them fronting on Grand Traverse Bay, a full mile of waterfront, 200 acres, elegant timber along the waterfront, the east end largely cleared, and on some of it an old apple pear, plum, and cherry orchard, badly run down. This I bought for $35 an acre. Some of our close friends were also interested in summer home, so they joined us. I planted the mile strip, making 10 acres running clear across the strip from the bay on the west to the public road to the east side. We kept 20 acres for our place. The rest we divided among our friends. No one could have a smaller parcel than 10 acres. We wanted privacy, no congested area. Each bought his own strip for $35 per acre, just what I had paid for it. From first to last, it was not a money-making project. <laughs> Strictly a voluntary cooperative affair. We wanted to hold costs down, etc. And so each owning absolutely his own place, yet we worked together. The place had an old farmhouse back where it was cleared. We got a man to live in it and look after things for us. He put in the gardens for us, all planting exactly what each person wanted. The time he spent for each, one was charged up to that one. He put up ice for those who wanted and had ice houses and wanted ice. We put in a water system, which he looked after, so we had septic tanks and a sewer system for each place. He did the little repairs, kept an eye on our houses when we were not there, uh, in the summer. We kept the same man for 20 years. It was simply astonishing how little it cost us individually. 
No one had more than 20 acres. Some had 10. Each cost according to what he had done. Some had large houses, big families, big gardens, etc. They paid more. One was a single woman who had 10 acres, no garden, a small cottage, etc. So it cost her much less. When our man was not needed, he was free to work for others, etc., etc. Our Michigan colony was a joy for us all. I am sure we all look back on it as one of our life's outstanding pleasures. They were a carefully selected bunch, two of them connected with the local Jacksonville College, one being the president of the college, the other the professor of English, an Oxford, England graduate. One was a distinguished Chicago doctor, one an Ohio, Ohio businessman, one connect with the Minnesota College at Faribault, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, two others were doctors. We pulled together, yet each did what we, he wished to do, paddled his own canoe. We had a gentleman's agreement that if anyone wanted to sell, he should first offer his place to the rest of us. If no one would give him what he thought was a fair price, he was privileged to sell to an outsider. Some of the original people still own their own their places, and it's still a going concern as it was at the start. Still run the same way. We owned our place over 20 years. We then developed other plans and sold it to a couple agreeable to the others. Some have died and the children took over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The first farmer who occupied the old terrace cottage built by the Walkers in the 1880s was Cliff Tompkins. They had three daughters, a pair of twins, Vera and the other, whose name I've forgotten, this is written by, you know, sure. Anyway, um, whose name I, I can't, I don't remember, um, I've forgotten. And a younger little curly-haired running-nosed girl, Tempest <laughs> Sunshine. <laughs> I was a Tempest Sunshine, is that a joke? But people, women, were, girls were named Tempest. <laughs> a common, it was a common name. Anyway, Tempest Sunshine, that was her name. Tempest Sunshine Tompkins, old Mission Michigan. Oh, oh, we used to, uh, the twins used to teach their, uh, tease their younger sister singing, Tempest Sunshine Tompkins, oh, Michigan Mish. Stuck her nose in a pickled dish <laughs> and, and would dissolve in giggles while te Tempest wept. <laughs> My uh, grandmother, Edith Capps Shambaugh, was from Jacksonville and had two sisters, Jeanette Capps Rammelkamp and Louise Capps Dunlap, who were among the Lunians. On hearing of Vought's find, they together decided it would be ideal were the three of them to have summer places along the Strip. And Uncle Philip Shambaugh related that in 1908, he traveled on the Manistee from Chicago directly to the old dock at Old Mission. They stayed at the Porter House, now Old Mission Inn, and went by horse and buggy to view the property on the West Bank that my grandfather, George Shambaugh, had acquired from Vought. Quote, we viewed the dense tangle of woods where the house was to be built. Several of the early settlers, among them the Vaughts, Miss Fairbank, Ames family, and later Dunlaps, spent their summers in tents. They got their water from the bay and used the woods for sanitation. This is the tent of the Griff Ames group. And Griff Ames is the grandfather of Judy Eno, for those who you know, you know Judy. Then in 1907, Griff Ames was the first to build a house on the Strip. It was a large cottage with the help of three other men. A servant, John Yates, the farmer, Cliff Tompkins, and Clarence Lardy, an old bishop and stonemason. His brother, Ben Ames, a businessman from Mount Vernon, Ohio, and brother of Griff, uh, built a larger home in 1912. This is the big house. This is the uh, house of uh, my grandfather's. The big house was the third house to be erected in 1912. Quote, old man Rhea. I'm not sure which Rhea that is. Chum Rhea. I'm not sure if it was Chum or Chum's father. Uh, uh, was the builder. This was 1912. 
this was Grandfather Shambaugh's house. This Mariah Fairbank built around 1913, followed by others on the strip. Vaught built around 1913 a two-story log house and a separate sleeping cabin. This is the house we looked at earlier with the second floor uh, sleeping porch. When Vaught sold off parts of his original purchase, he retained the farmhouse and the more established orchards. Each parcel he sold incorporated land from the shore back to Peninsula Drive and included some woods and a strip of ancient overgrown orchard. The latter was gradually cleared of overgrowth and upgraded. Both, each cottager had his own vegetable garden in his orchard area. To facilitate the operation of these small orchards, individual owners banded together to form the Illini Orchards Company. The deal was that the expenses of the farms were individually, uh, were divided equally amongst the members of the newly formed Illini Orchards Company, Vaught, Shambaugh, the two Fairbanks, Griff and Ben Ames, and the Dewey Milligan Combine. <coughs> the proceeds of the orchards went to the owners of the individual properties. This was an excellent deal for Vaught, since he had the most extensive and fruitful orchards, <laughs> but a financial drain for the others. So, Pop, that means George Emma, Phillips, Father, um, bought out the orchards and proceeded to farm them at an annual loss. The orchards north of Old Mission Road contained very old precious apple trees and Flemish beauty pear trees, which must have been planted many years before, perhaps about 1870, according to uh, Philip Shamba. Perhaps these had been planted by Mr. Reynolds as part of his experimental farm. Then in the fall of 1913, uh, records I saw on the computer, uh, have L.O. Vaught disposed of 50 barrels of wealthy apples, a brand, bearing the Sunny Ripe label at $4.50 a barrel, bought by the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Every apple in the 50 barrels was inspected and pronounced perfect by a representative of the Western Michigan Development Bureau. <laughs> this is at the same time that the greater part of the 1913 apple crop from the Grand Traverse section of Western Michigan was being sold at less than 350 a barrel. So uh, on the one hand, uh, the uh, Vought said he had a very, you know, run-down orchards, but uh, by 1913, he'd uh, straightened them out more. Cliff Tompkins had straightened them out a bit. And prior to 1918, Cliff Tompkins and his family moved from Treasure Cottage, that large white house that we referred to earlier. Mr. Floyd Wilbur and family moved from Boyne City, Michigan, to their new home in Old Mission, Michigan, in Old Mission, March 1918, as manager of a summer resort and fruit farm, the Illini Orchards Company. This is Mr. and Mrs. Wilbur in the Rose Garden. Um, this is what this section is called Illini Orchards. And this was by Addison Wilbur, and these are his parents. Uh, we moved from Boeing City to our new home in Old Mission on March 1918. I was 10 years old then. We shipped our household goods by rail to Traverse City and then transferred them to two wagons for the 18-mile haul out to the peninsula. Floyd and I were perched on one wagon and mother and dad rode on the other. It was a long, tiresome trip, and by the time we got there, it was late afternoon. As we neared our destination, we were met by Mr. John Marshall, who was to become our good neighbor. He introduced himself and told us that we, uh, when we got our goods unloaded and stowed away, we should come over and have dinner at his house. We visited a while and he told us that while our house had been vacant, he had been checking on it occasionally. Also, he mentioned that he had tapped the maple trees around the house to make maple syrup and that we would find a half dozen pails of sap in the house which we could just dump out. <laughs> uh, this information was later to become of great significance. After goods were unloaded, Dad built a fire in the stove to warm up the house. 
Later, Floyd went upstairs and noticed that one room, in one room, the wall was warm and looked red. Dad rushed up to the out to the woodpile and got the axe and chopped into the wall and found <coughs> the water in the to the house had not yet been turned on, but we did have those pails of maple sap <laughs> <laughs> left by Mr. Marshall. So we doused out the fire to keep it from spreading. They gave us some time. This gave us some time to open up a rainwater cistern and dip out water to finish the job. In those days, we did not have a fire department to call on, so we felt fortunate that we had not lost our house. Uh, Mr. Wilbur, with a number of the children of the cottagers, and uh, I believe sitting next to him uh, on the on his left is my mother. So I. Put this picture around. Uh, I don't remember when we got our first truck, but I do recall how glad we were to have it. It was a model Ford Model T that had to be cranked to start the engine. The headlights worked off of the generator and dimmed when the engine slowed, but to us it was a godsend. Eventually we got a farm tractor that eased Dad's work materially, particularly in tending the orchards. Watts departure and the uh, water system. Uh, in 1923, Watts sold his waterfront property to my grandfather, George Shamble. At the same time, a water system agreement was signed by the Illini Orchard Cottagers. L.O. Vaught, George E. Shamba, Edith C. Shamba, Grace Dewey, J.G. Ames, A.D. and F.J. Fairbank, Sarah Moran Fairbank. There was a well house a well and pump house, and a water pipe extending to all parties. In 1928, it's five years later, Vaught sold the orchards and farmhouse, Treasure Cottage, now also known as Wilbur House, to G. E. Shamba. Dr. Shamba purchased the orchard and garden plots from Ames, Ramelkamp, Dewey Milligan, and Swift, all the orchards out to Peninsula Drive. Dr. Shamba consolidated the gardens as well as the orchards, locating the former in the fertile upper orchard. The Illini Orchards Company members became the Illini Cottagers Association. That's the change. And that's what we have here. This brings us back to the new garden. This was around 1947. At the time of this photo, there were 11 plots, each one demarked with a large wooden white sign. Did you pick that up, John? Um, there would be a rosy at each side of the plot, and then bought on each side of the plot, Shambon. Uh, Dewey, etc. And uh, each plot measured 35 feet north-south by 200 feet east-west. And uh, for you who like to garden, you know that there's a little bit of work there. <laughs> and the work was done, the garden was planted and tilled by the resident farmer. Floyd Wilbur was the original farmer doing this. And he was replaced around 1942 and succeeded by Robert Fuller. Finally, as Vaught closed his letter in 1947, I think this is appropriate, I fear I am becoming a bore. <coughs> It's easy for an old man to look over dear dead days of the past and dream dreams. So I will sign off. <laughs> <laughs> and we're more than happy to take any questions. I, I questioned about the, I 
I'm suspect of the questions that my brothers might ask. <laughs> so aside from that, I'm sure that they will be able to help me answer any questions. You so how many of the original cottages are still there? Or have people rebuilt? Or? Uh, most of the original cottages are still there. Uh, other cottages have been added to the mix. Mm -hmm. but so it's not all, just at least 10 acres now it's been divided more? Right, yeah. And I only know of uh, one structure that's, uh, no, two structures that are not there. Mr. Vaught's log house was taken down around 1960, 62, something like that. And uh, uh, Ms. Fairbanks, uh, or, or Mr. Fairbanks' brother's house was taken down um, after, I'm not, I'm not sure when, but before 1970. <coughs> yes? Bob, are they still all the original families and their descendants, or have uh, pretty pieces been sold outside the original families? Uh, pretty much so. Uh, the uh, certain families have acquired more properties, so they have, and they have, their extended families are there. Um, <coughs> I can't think of any, uh, the only uh, uh, additional party were the uh, uh, Penny Polly's uh, parents, uh, um, West, uh, Bonnie and her husband, uh, West, 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 Robert, 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 Thank you, Phil. <laughs> and, uh, and they are at the north end of uh, the strip. And, and, it, and indeed, that property was not part of the original parcel. Mm -hmm. was unclear. It's unclear. Right. Unclear. Uh, okay. Because I, I know one uh, one plant I, I saw had it belonging to G.E. Shamba. Uh, so, uh, and you know these documents that are filed legally. <laughs> can't, can't be suspect. <laughs> John, would you mind sharing some of the anecdotes of uh, your time with the McNamara's? Uh, not without offending my wife. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when I started dating Bob, uh, one of his girlfriends was Marky McNamara. <laughs> Very cool, darling girl. Yeah, who, who was Robert McNamara's daughter? Daughter. daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So Secretary of Defense. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but he wasn't on the strip. Oh, he wasn't? Well, he, he was, was on the extension of the strip, which is down in, in Walker that, Woods. That was the call. He that was, was a wannabe? No, no. He, he didn't have any of that. Uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> he didn't. Yeah, Phil. You, you mentioned Walker earlier as being one of the historical figures. And the, wa and the woods and the beachfront to the south of Old Mission Road was always known as Walker Woods. Right, still right. that was the same Walker that owned uh, to the north and uh, Edith Shambaugh wanted her husband to buy what was Walker Woods for, uh, I don't know what the price was, but uh, what I was reading said that uh, he didn't do so and later his relatives and uh, and others bought it at about ten times that price. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, it's curious to me that <clears throat> the folks on uh, uh, Forest Avenue are from Central Illinois, or many of them were originally, uh, Springfield, right, Spring. primarily, and then you all are primarily from Jacksonville, Illinois. And these two are, I've lived in that whole area, and these two are not far apart. Is there any connection? Well, uh, my uh, great aunt, Jeanette, uh, who was married to the president of Illinois College, uh, every year uh, had to give a tea, uh, have a tea at her house for the wives of trustees of Illinois College who lived in Springfield oh. and, and lived um, in uh, Leffingwell over on Forest mm -hmm. Avenue. So uh, she said that it was the one time of year she had to put on her long stock, her long uh, gloves and, <laughs> and stockings. And, uh, uh, she did 
didn't, well, well I'm sure she enjoyed doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so the Ramo Camps, uh, um, Caps, uh, Jeanette Caps married um, Charles Henry. Charles, Charles Henry Ramo Camp. And uh, so that got the Ramo Camps in. And uh, so we have uh, one of the. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the, the other side. The other side would be Dewey. So, so that's how that would have uh, transpired. So, but were all the garden pops, was that up on your property then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Up at the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. The uh, garden plots ran from from the road to uh, the what's now the telephone pole, the or I guess the power pole, uh, at the uh, north, right near what's our vineyard, mm -hmm. and they had this uh, system with the uh, uh, two different uh, signs for each party, and it rotated every year because the. Uh, uh, the southernmost par uh, parcel portion uh, did not produce as well because it had uh, shade from the trees on Old Mission Road. So, uh, but people really respected uh, uh, others' uh, uh, property in, as far as what was being grown. And but it, at the end of the year, I recall. Uh, when we knew the people had left, <laughs> we, could, uh, we could scavenge. And I remember a, a dinner, well, it must have been around uh, uh, 1950 or 51, when uh, we had a uh, gathering at my grandfather's house, the big house. And uh, I think we had, I don't know, 40 or 60 years of corn. It was just uh, <laughs> outrageous. We made uh, log cabins with uh, <laughs> corn cows. <laughs> right. So what happened to your original house? Could you, you said you have a newer house. Oh, the, uh, the original uh, farmhouse, the uh, treasure cottage that was built by Mr. Walker in 1870 was taken down uh, in around 1870. No, not around 1970. Uh, it had, there had been a fire in it, and uh, my aunt uh, and uncle owned it, and for a number of reasons, they also took down the Vaught House uh, for uh, good reason, I'm sure. And uh, but uh, some people would look at some pictures and say, well, it wasn't deteriorating the way they maybe said it was. But, uh, um, so. I'll pass this. Uh... Well, one of the things that um, Bob's aunt and uncle, who owned the parcel of property that we live on, asked when uh, when we bought the property from them in 1994, um, Bob's aunt said, "Well, I've saved the, um, uh, the railing, saved the railing up from the, the original staircase. It's beautiful." Mm -hmm. She said, and she said, "I hope when you build a house, you'll incorporate it." Mm -hmm. So it really is a beautiful piece of woodwork. And, um, but when it came time to have the inspectors look at it, it was too low. And so we had to elevate it by about a foot, um, which sort of indicates that people made it shorter then. <laughs> they had longer arms. <laughs> Jack Salmonson and his coal company. When we did work down along there, we were always running into these metal pipes laying on the ground. And he, I mentioned it to him, he told me in passing that the water system was way up on the hill with a wood mill and a tank, and it was all gravity fed to the cottages. And knowing Jack, I didn't know if he was having fun at my expense. <laughs> that was, that was uh, somewhat true. Uh, the, uh, the well, Originally, the well, the water intake for Vought was a pipe that went out in the lake. And later, uh, he put in a, uh, a well and had a, uh, a little engine, I guess a one-cylinder one engine that made a 
and uh, uh, it was a, a, apparently a dangerous piece of equipment because Mr. Wilbur uh, would not let his uh, anybody from his family. He was the only one that started that or stopped that machine, <laughs> and uh, he would send uh, children up to the orchard with the water pumped up to the orchard, and there was a cistern up there, which I am told was open-topped and covered with uh, scum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he'd send his children up to see uh, whether the water level of the cistern, whether it was overflowing. And if it was overflowing, then he would go down and turn off the water, uh, turn off the pump. And then when they needed to put refill the uh, cistern, he would uh, go up there and go down to the well and start the pump. Now, when people would come up at the beginning of the season uh, from uh, uh, southern climes, uh, Jacksonville, Illinois, or Chicago, and other places, they uh, encountered something they referred to as old missionitis. <laughs> I believe it was because of uh, these things that might have been swimming around in the, in the system. <laughs> So, I, I think the water from the cottage is fed from the cistern. Hmm? Where the cottage is fed water from the cistern. It came down from the, uh, from the orchard in a uh, two inch uh, pipe and uh, progressed down uh, to a uh, uh, one inch. And then, as, as it got further to the uh, north, with fewer houses on the, uh, uh, on the line, it got even smaller, and so that uh, uh, the people at the end, the Dunlaps, uh, if they were, uh, would turn on the spigot, they might have no flow, uh, because the people before them were, uh, were using it. And I think there at one point was a, uh, a windmill, and uh, I can't, uh, can't be sure about that. Yes. So when was the season and what kinds of occupations did people have that they could come for a season? Uh, I think the season, like for my grandmother and her two sisters, the season was uh, they would come up uh, early and spend the summer and go back when school started again and their husbands would come back and forth on the uh, resort special, uh, usually uh, starting around 1910, 1912, the railroad uh, started coming up the resort special, mm -hmm. and they would uh, have a sleeping car uh, that they would uh, uh, decouple and put on the siding mm -hmm. at the railroad station in town, and then uh, people would go in to pick them up uh, at, at their leisure. And, uh, but uh, before then, uh, they, people did come by uh, by a boat, either going to uh, uh, Bars Harbor or going to uh, Old Mission Harbor, going to Traverse City, and then out by uh, uh, other boats to uh, Bars Harbor. Um, a lot of uh, college professors, I believe, uh, I think my grandfather, being a doctor in Chicago, I don't think he had the opportunity to spend uh, all that much time up here. Uh, but some of the professors, I guess, were able to. Let's take a couple of last questions and then pull her together. Okay. Hey, Bob, I just wanted to share something you may not know, that my grandmother was the summer girl for your grandmother. Mm. Or your mother, let's see who would that be. Her Uncle George. Right. That's how she first came up here and when she was 18. We figured out today what year that was. Was she here with a, another friend? I, I don't know about her, Martha Bradford? I yeah. think. Martha, Martha and then, Bradford. And then they ended then, up buying the property. And then, well, she oh. was the summer girl, and but she was at Illinois College, mm. and she met my grandfather at Illinois College, and then they were able to buy our place in like 
1921 or something. Yeah, um, but it was because of your, because of your, the, uh, George. George or uh, because of, the, in, at Illinois College. Oh, the, then she that worked, was the, yeah. she worked up here. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Everybody got very inner, summer girls. <laughs> what? This is summer. Her kids. kids. Hey, kids. Oh. Why, George would have gone back to Chicago to, you know, doctor, yeah. and his wife would be left up there. With six kids. With a bunch of kids, yeah. Six and kids. having yeah. to do the girls. diapers on the. All you know. terrors. That's right. <laughs> well, you're the brother, so you're Phil. Thank you, Ben. I know. <laughs> This, uh, these signs that we have here were made by uh, Dave Fuller. Uh, so they would have been made uh, after 1942. Mm -hmm. He made these signs as a, uh, a shop project uh, in high school. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, from what they have at uh, Leffingwell where they had a sidewalk in front of uh, all the houses, and I'm told that on the uh, weekends at least, the re residents would get out and, I don't know if the term promenade is proper, but they would walk <coughs> up and down in front of the houses. So, uh, to get to, to, to modern day, uh, we ended up putting up fences, uh, gates, at the end of the roads uh, because uh, uh, of uh, theft during the, uh, uh, during the winter time <laughs> and uh, also to uh, dissuade uh, hunters from coming through. And the hunters were running their dogs, I don't know if they still do, uh, I'm not against hunting, uh, but they would run their dogs through with radio collars, mm -hmm. and the, uh, they would be on the, on the roads with, uh, with their cars. And then if the dogs stopped because they had a, uh, say, a coon tree, then the hunters knew that they, they could go drive in mm -hmm. to where they were <laughs> and uh, kill their prey. Mm -hmm. So we put up... Uh, before my time, um, <coughs> gates to uh, stop both the, th the theft and the uh, uh, movement in and out of hunters. I think we better pull it to a close here. I want to thank uh, Bob and Penny tremendously here. They was the one who, who came up with the idea for this presentation. So thank you, Jackie, for doing that.